Welcome to the God Story Radio Broadcast with Chaplain Lynn. Thank you, Brother Ron. This is Chaplain Lynn. God's Story is a ministry outreach about our great, caring God being seen in and throughout His people's lives. Many say, Does God care about me? Does He see what I'm going through? Does He know me personally? God's Story tells of His great love for people like you and me. The greatest demonstration of His love is His precious Son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross of Calvary for our sins. The veil between God and mankind has been torn open. Be encouraged as you listen to today's testimony or sermon from a changed life now filled with a passionate love for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! What a lovely afternoon to have servant of the Lord Aaron Campbell with us. I met Aaron at the Middle Town Aglow many years ago. Middle Town Aglow today meets at the Solid Rock Church in the Lawrence Bishop Life Center, room 225, the second Wednesday of the month at 9.30 a.m. Solid Rock Church is at 903 Union Road, Lebanon, Ohio. Aaron is a dynamic, on-fire, passionate Christian, Christian woman with a heart to impart the message of freedom from bondages that plague God's people. Welcome to our program today, Aaron. We appreciate your sharing with us. Oh, thank you, Lynn. Hallelujah. It's good to be here. Yes. Many, many years. I, I've seen you many, many years ago, but it's so wonderful to see you now. Thank you. Yes. I, I, I've always enjoyed your vibrant ministry. Well, that's the Lord, if you see anything good, because he is taking me from the depths of a depression, addiction, depravity, um, darkness, and into his light. And anything that comes forward that you find appealing has to be him. It has to be. Oh, hallelujah. And how that will help our viewers today on the program who are listening in. Well, I hope so. Well, and I know that's your heart's desire. Yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we, I believe, suffer from as we um, move in this world is the influence of the culture upon our lives. And we get into a place sometimes that it's hard for us to discern what is of God, what is the culture, what is me, what is my voice, what is the devil's voice, how do I discern, you know. And and I think that's something that the Lord has a desire, of course, to call us into his intimacy so that we are not plagued by the things that the world is. And um, But unless we're there, unless we have the Spirit of the Lord in us, we cannot get there. It simply cannot be done through behavior modification or positive, power of positive thinking or through, you know, living the right lifestyle and morality. It is truly through the miraculous movement of the Holy Spirit within us to, to bring us into that embrace of freedom. And, um, and that's Christ, why Christ came. He came to set us free. Amen. Would you like to tell us how this journey began for you, uh, were you when you were young? Or how, how did you find Christ? Okay. Well, that's an interesting question. How did I find Christ? Because or how did he really, find you? Right, exactly. And I, <laughs> you know, that's, that's an interesting, uh, I, I'm glad that you actually worded it that way because a lot of us will say that I gave my life to Jesus Christ when the truth of the reality is, is that he gave his life for us. Amen. And he called us into that relationship. He is the one and true God, Jesus Christ. And he came from his throne room in heaven and came to earth made himself, lowered himself into the um, incarnate man be, to become fully man and fully God. But he came to us instead of us being required to do what it takes to get to him. There is no way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. This is not something that I understood. I never heard the gospel message ever growing up. Uh, I was raised by an atheist and by a Mormon. So the only understanding of God was through a, a cursory view, if you will, through uh, the Mormon church. And um, in, as a child, I didn't quite understand any of that. Um, but did, did you go to the Mormon church? Well, I was introduced, through, they call it primary school. So it was kind of like Sunday school or, or youth group, if you will, um, in the evenings. 
Um, but I did not quite, I tried really hard, but I was desperately afraid of God, um, only because I felt like I could never measure up. And that was probably one of the places where the lie began to enter into me, um, that I had to measure up to a certain standard in order to find um, the Lord's approval. And, and that, again, is not a, the, the gospel message. Um, of course, the gospel message is that there is no way to find his approval, in fact, until we receive the Christ, the love of the Lord, who calls us in and gives us that new life. And it's through his redemption that we have complete access into the full embrace and fellowship with God. But coming from the other side, if you were ever taught that you had to be good enough to get to heaven or that you were not good enough to get to heaven, then that um, brings forth a, a corrupted view of who God is. And so um, my mother was not a good Mormon. Of course, she married an atheist, right? And my father, although very loving, did not have an understanding of, of God. So we never talked about God in our home, never, not even once. We moved to Utah, and if you weren't Mormon, you actually were on the outside of the bubble. So that added another um, element of uh, rebellion, if you will. And so that rebellion increased. And so I found the comfort of friendship in high school and in junior high with those who were uh, uh, rebellious. So you felt pressure to become a Mormon in Utah? Well, either you were or you weren't. Okay. So if you weren't, then you're you're on the outside. You're, you were in trouble. Yeah. 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 So um, so there really wasn't anything in between. Um, I found my junior year the reality of that, and when I when I came to um, learn that my friends were only there for the party scene, and I actually wasn't Mormon, and I wasn't part of that party scene any longer because I did not find true friendship there. And so I just kind of went into the books and I just earned a scholarship to college. That's all I wanted to do was earn a scholarship. But once I was there, um, because you have earned a scholarship does not make you uh, acceptable, especially if you're still in Utah. All right. So um, you, you couldn't win no matter what you did. There really wasn't a place for me. Yes, you didn't fit. So I went right back into the place that was familiar and that was the party scene. Um, However, I learned that if I was there, then I could not be acceptable to God. And I developed a, um, a faith, if you will, because atheism is a faith. You have, you have to believe very strongly that there isn't a God because the compelling work of God upon you to be able to deny that means that you have to work against a force beyond one's ability. I, I actually have to sit here today because I studied philosophy to argue against the existence of God. My degree was in computer science, which is totally science, very logical base. And philosophy, which is the complete opposite, is looking into the, the, um, the, the method in which you can develop a logical sequence and be able to come into a, a conclusion that um, meets whatever faith that you have. And my faith was that there was no God. So, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous now when I think about it. Because to deny the existence of God requires something that is so deceived. And I was in a, the deepest, darkest deception you can possibly find. Um, and I also developed a, um, an entry into uh, drugs and alcohol. Because I was not satisfied with who I was. I could not measure up to what people were expecting of me. And I had a deep sense of insecurity because of the darkness and the deception. And so the only way that I could be who I thought I needed to be was by through drugs and alcohol. Oh. By the time I was 30 years of age, I was a full-blown alcoholic, functioning alcoholic and a businesswoman. And, um, but I was very, very secure in my atheist belief, if you will. Interesting. So, so I met Jesus Christ on Bourbon Street. On Bourbon Street in New Orleans. In New Orleans. Wow. I was there on business. And I was, um, it was during the final four in 1993 and I was 30 years of age and, um, and I, I found my place in, on the bar stool, which is where I would normally find my place. And I went for a walk with a brand new hurricane, if you will, in my hand, you could walk with in the streets with these drinks and I was all by myself. And there was a street corner evangelist on one end of the street 
And I noticed that all the other street shows, like the jazz musicians and, you know, the tarot card readers and the fire eater breathers, they all had money going into their guitar cases, but the street corner evangelist had nobody. And I felt kind of sorry for him because that freak show over there, the street corner evangelist had no one. And I felt Uh, like I could help him. Yes. So I had every argument against the existence of God. In fact, my final thesis was uh, actually, I was arguing that, uh, uh, final uh, grade with a debate. And so I knew exactly what they would throw out there. And so I just figured I could help him out. So it, was, so it was vigorous, a vigorous, and you had a crowd around you while you were debating this evangelist. Well, I was attempting to. It was 3 <laughs> o'clock in the morning. I was three sheets to the wind with a great heart for uh, to help him out. And he won over. Oh, but Jesus won over. He did indeed. In Jesus fact, won he, over. As I was arguing, he did not debate back. And for the very first time, I'm sitting with, or standing, if you will, with a Christian that didn't debate me. For the very first time, I saw love. Oh. He looked at me, and he said, clearly, as he looked at me in my face and to my eyes, and he says, darling, he says, you don't have to do that. He says, you're just looking for your long-lost love, that's all. Oh. And his name is Jesus. Oh. And for anyone who has ever experienced oh. the love of God, and not the judgment of man, will know that that's something you cannot argue against. It is real, and it's authentic. Mm. Oh, how beautiful. How beautiful. We appreciate your tuning in. You're listening to God's Story on WGNZ with Chaplain Lynn, speaking with Aaron Campbell. If you want more information, you can email me at chaplainlynnradio at gmail.com. What a beautiful story. It's a love story. It is. It is a love story. You know, I'd like to say that I made a decision that day. However, he he, uh, was persistent in his love. I mean, this man left the comforts of his home uh, and was on the streets at 3 o'clock in the morning with a bunch of uh, drunk revelers, partiers, and received abuse all night long. And yet he was obedient to the Lord to throw the seeds of the gospel out. Now, I didn't make a decision that day, but I heard the gospel clearly. He told me that, that Jesus was God and that he came from heaven to share about the Father's love. And he told me that, that he died on the cross for my sins and that there would be no way that I could be good enough to get to heaven. And he says, I'm not defined by what I did or by what people have done to me, but I'm defined by who God says I am. Oh. And he said that you were loved. And I will never, ever, ever forget what he said next. He said, you were forgiven. He says, well, you just need to receive Christ as your Lord. And as far as the east is from the west, your sins will be remembered no more. It will be like a clean slate, that you will be again, again as a new creation. Oh. But I didn't make a decision that day. That's understandable. A lot of people do that. They hear the message, and the seeds just sort of are planted in their heart, but it takes a little bit of time for them to grow. But you knew that you were hearing truth and you were hearing life. Well, I I heard something that was too good to be true. Yes. Because I never saw it from any other Christian, nor had anyone ever demonstrated love. They always wanted to argue me into faith. Oh. And because if you, I had all these arguments, they were trying to outwit me or outmaneuver or out, out, uh, uh, bring logic into something. You can't bring logic into the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Yes. Is something that can be um, received by love. Yes. And that love from that man would not be recognized again until six months later. And how did that uh, become recognized to you? Well, again, that seed of the Holy Spirit's wooing. I mean, there was, there was a moment where you realize there's something else going on. I was in Columbus, Ohio, six months later on business again and on a bar stool again. And on behind the bar was a banner, and it said that Billy Graham was coming into town. And this was 1993. How wonderful to be in a bar to have a banner That's marketing. Billy Graham. That's effective marketing, <laughs> right? So I'm looking at this banner, and I'm, I'm talking to this bartender who was very friendly. And, um, and actually, she was trying to pick me up. She was a homosexual bartender. God can use everyone. Oh, totally. He uses everybody. He can use a whale, a donkey. <laughs> That's right. He can That's use right. a gay bartender. But, um, but I, said, I was looking at that banner and I said I you know I feel like I should go to that and she looked at me and she looked at how much I had to drink 
And she looked at me again and she said, well, maybe you should. And she gave me permission, literally, to go to the very last day of a Billy Graham crusade. Now, Lynn, this is during the time where Jimmy Swagger, Jim Baker, yes. all those evangelists were going down. Yes. And uh, to me, Billy Graham was just one of them. So I didn't know one evangelist from the next. But I was compelled by the love of God. He was wooing me. So the next morning I woke up, severe hangover. Never gotten up early on a Sunday morning ever in my life. I get into my car and I drive into a town that I do not know. And I'm from Arizona. I go into Columbus, Ohio, and I'm driving in a town that I do not know to go to a stadium where I am going to be meeting a uh, the works and the works of God through an evangelist by the name of Billy Graham, whom I knew nothing about except for he was an evangelist. So I get into the stadium, and I all I can remember, Lynn, is that I remember do not look at Christians in the eye because they will read your mail. I remember looking down because I was so convicted by the love of that street corner evangelist on Bourbon Bourbon Street. That still held to you. He knew. He knew. He read my mail. He knew that I was cloaked in shame and addiction, and he loved me, and he saw the potential. He saw God's potential in me. And nowhere, nowhere have I ever seen that in the lives of any Christian that I had met, only because I was so difficult to get along with. I can only imagine, but this person did not see that. So I go in and I sit down and Billy Graham comes out and he begins to preach. Now his message was exactly consistent with what I heard from the street corner evangelist, that you cannot earn your way into heaven, that there's nothing you can do to even clean your, your act, that there is no way that you'll ever be good enough. In fact, that's why Jesus died is because there is nothing that we can do to earn what it would take. Christ had to do that, and he did it on the cross. And it's because of his death at Calvary and his resurrected life and his ascension into the heavens and his calling forth from his love into our lives that we can find that place that we have longed for all along and that alcohol or drugs or eating or gambling or drinking, smoking, um, pornography or shopping, whatever it is, We'll never, ever meet that need. It will never fill our hearts. We have empty hearts. Every one of us does. Yes. And we all have something. Yes, we all do. In order to fill that until we find Christ. Right. Well, the time came for him to call people down to make a decision. Yes. And I chose instead to stand, but fear entered my heart. And I ran out of that stadium just as I ran away from that street corner evangelist. And I ran as fast as I could out that door. I ran as fast as I could actually up the stadium steps and out the double doors. And I just needed to get back to the place from which I came. I just needed to go back because this is just too good to be true. Mm. It's too good to be true. I thought there had to be a scam to this, right? This can't be this good. It can't be that easy. Yes, it's so easy. Even a Three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old child, maybe even a two-year-old can receive Jesus Christ. Right. And the greatest theological mind, scientific mind, uh, and theological mind can't comprehend it. Yes. It's only the Spirit of the Lord. Yes. As I was walking to my car, I just needed to get out there. I heard Billy Graham speak over the loudspeaker, and he began to pray. And he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Mm. thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And when he said, on earth as it is in heaven, I knew I was going down. My knees started to shake. I knew I was going down. And even an atheist has heard the Lord's Prayer. I hadn't heard none. Nothing else sounded familiar. But the Lord's Prayer was. And the love that I felt through the message of the purity of the gospel message of Christ was familiar to me from that street corner evangelist. I grabbed a hold of my chain link fence that was right in front of me. And I fell down, and right there, I met Jesus Christ. He brought forth the most miraculous movement of God to bring this atheist into a sold-out believer of Christ before I stood to my knees, or stood to my feet. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know how long I was on the ground. I do not know. I was crying. I was pouring out. I was confessing. Oh, how beautiful. So I met Jesus Christ in the parking lot of a Billy Graham crusade, running away from God. (laughs) But you know what? You cannot run away oh, from the love no, of God. Oh, no, you can't. You can't. You can't. He surrounded you. Aaron, so then you left the parking lot. Tell us what happened after that. 
Well, I didn't really understand what to do next. Um, if you have never had a Christian friend because you have been an atheist all of your adult life, what do you do next? And so I went back into my life. But one thing I do remember hearing from the Billy Graham message is about the Holy Spirit. And he says, when you pray, to pray means you are connecting with the Father um, in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I just began to pray. And as you pray, you are one with the Father because you are being heard by Him and you know you're being heard by Him because the Spirit bears witness with you, which is completely foreign to anything that I've ever known before in my life. And so I would pray before I would go into my meetings. I would sit into the in the car and I would pray and the the Lord answered my prayer. You and mean I your business there. meetings? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And everything just went so smoothly. And it's like, well, why didn't anybody tell me this before? Well, of course I never gave anyone an opportunity to. But the the strength of that love only grew and grew as my prayer life became more and more uh, alive. It became part of my everyday existence. So I found that the Lord was literally guiding not only my the meetings I was conducting in these cities that I was going to, but was conducting me and my decisions I was making in my life. And so I would literally pray because I'd never been to church before. Where do I go? And I would drive and the Lord would literally move me into pull into a parking lot and I would go to church there. Did you have a Bible then? Of course not. No, I didn't have anything. You just had the Holy Spirit in your heart directing you and leading you. It was so natural. The supernatural became natural to me instantly, as he does, because he gave us a new life, the Holy Spirit. And so I would pull in, and then I would sit and listen to these messages, and I would cry and cry and cry through the messages. I would cry through the songs. And and many people say, well, I don't like hymns, but I'm telling you what, I I fell in love with the Lord through the hymns because... Mm. The hymns were actually speaking words that I could not perform, form in my own thinking because Christ is outside of the logic. He's in spirit. But he allows us to communicate with human words, with words of wisdom. And these hymn hymn writers were not motivated by big labels or, you know, popular songs. They were writing from the spirit. Amen. And the message of the gospel is in the hymns. A lot of them are. Yes. And even the message of pain, of life. Yes. Or the, the power of God in those painful situations in life. The messages, I would listen to every single word that every pastor would preach. And it was as though it were spoken to me. So the Lord directed me exactly to the places I need to go. Mm, how but beautiful. I did not buy a Bible until I was delivered. And that would be some five years later. So I wasn't discipled, but I truly was a believer. I know that today. Oh, and that's good for us all to hear because there's different uh, phases that God takes us through, what different steps that God takes us through. And we may look at some and say, well, you're just not saved because you have this and this and this. But in the depths of their heart, they know that they are. Right. And and no one can judge that. That That is only by an individual. And yes. their relationship with the Father exactly. through the Son, sacrifice, yes. and the yes. power of that, that work of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, faith is not a feeling. It's not a judgment call from the intellect. It is spirit. And so there are times where you will have no feelings at all, that you will feel like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. But that does not mean we're not saved. And it right? doesn't mean that he's not hearing you. Or he's not hearing you. And there he has his time and his seasons to hear us. Yes. And he knows what's good for us, and he has uh, purposes for us to go through right. until he answers our prayers. And and those answers come in ways that, uh, the first thing that I learned, it doesn't come in the ways in which I would expect them to come. But oh, exactly. <laughs> the whole point is, is that I would much rather have him direct my life than, than, to, uh, than anything. Yes. Because the... Do, 
the direction that my life was going was ending in a very bad place. And I knew that. Yes. I had suicidal thoughts. I had depression. I had alcoholism. I had uh, success in the, in the world. But that success in the world means nothing if you're not allowed to enjoy the life that you're meant to live. I would much rather have nothing and Christ know nothing except for the surpassing knowledge of Christ than to have the six figure incomes and the success in a worldly standard and to be where I was. And so that was evidently clear, very, very clear, very, very quickly. But he is so interested in us all the way down to the very thought. He is so interested in us. He beckons us with that love because he's calling us into a purpose that he's preparing us in advance. Oh, exactly. How beautiful. Mm. And, you know, and that would lead to my deliverance. Yes. Which uh, is a whole nother story, but it's one that I think is something that, that many of us need to know that he does do this miraculous work. I love the way the Lord has made our lives like a patchwork. Mm. How we have different circumstances, different parentage, different experiences. And he takes all these and he makes a beautiful mosaic out of it. Mm. I appreciate your coming so much. What a beautiful testimony. God bless you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in today to God's Story. We pray that you have been blessed. Make sure that you tune in next Wednesday at the same time, 1.30 p.m., for another edition of God's Story. If you'd like to reach God's Story, you can email chaplainlynradio at gmail.com. Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross to reconcile all things unto himself. Part of that all things is you and me. To reconcile is to restore to union and friendship after estrangement. God's deepest desire is to be close to you and to share his heart with you. He desires a deep, intimate relationship with you, wanting to walk and talk with you day by day. He does walk with us and talks with us through his written word, the Bible. The Bible tells God's story through the ages. God has a story that he would like to impart into your life. He loves to make himself known to his children. May your heart be open and may your eyes see God's gracious, loving hand move in your life today. Isn't it wonderful while living here on this earth that the creator of the universe who made you and me wants to be part of our lives? Jesus brought restoration of what has been stolen from us, true peace while living on this earth. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. The lovely hymn written by Warren Cornell, Wonderful Peace has these words, Peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above, Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Thank you for tuning in today to God's Story. We pray that you have been blessed. Make sure that you tune in again next Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. or Friday at 12.30 p.m. for another edition of God's Story. If you would like to hear more God's Story broadcast, tune into YouTube or anywhere you download your favorite podcasts. One can also listen live at WGNZ.com. To reach God's Story, please email chaplainlynradio at gmail.com. Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross to reconcile all things unto himself. Part of that all things is you and me. To reconcile is to restore to union and friendship after estrangement. God's deepest desire is to be close to you and share his heart with you. He desires a deep, intimate relationship with you and wants to walk and talk with you day by day. He does walk with us and talks with us through his written word, the Bible. The Bible tells God's story through the ages. God has a story that he would like to impart into your life. He loves to make himself known to his children. May your heart be open and may your eyes see God's gracious, loving hand moving in your life today. Isn't it wonderful while living life here on this earth that the creator of the universe 
who made you and me wants to be part of our lives? Jesus brought restoration of what has been stolen from us, true peace while living on this earth. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. The lovely hymn written by Warren Cornell, Wonderful Peace, has these words. Peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. This is Chaplain Lynn saying, May the wonderful peace of Jesus Christ fill you to overflowing today. May you experience the depths of his sweet love and how much God loves you.